the new ABC chairman's push to fix the network's green left bias. News poll and another poll just out tonight showing that Albanese is on the back foot and backlash against the palace for its shocking handling of Princess Kate's cancer diagnosis. We'll cross live to London with the latest. But first tonight, the University of Sydney locked pro-Palestinian activists inside a room with senior Israeli university officials for an hour and a half last week. Tel Aviv University representatives flew from Israel to attend the University of Sydney's Abroad Fair, which promotes their university exchange program. The Israeli academics were there alongside other university representatives from Germany, Canada, the United States and Taiwan. But pro-Palestinian activists stormed the room trying to get the Tel Aviv University kicked off campus. We can end this system which sees the butchers of Gaza come to UCIT's campus, sees UCIT students pushed out for speaking about Palestine, while the people who are literally responsible get their own store with a private security guard. Tel Aviv University plays an active role in, in training IDF lawyers. We want them off our campus. The Israeli delegates didn't think that they should have to succumb to the demands of the protesters and leave, seeing as they'd flown from Israel for this. Shockingly, instead of removing the pro-Palestinian activists, Sydney University had security lock the doors, locking the activists inside the same room as the Israeli delegates. Let, just that, let that just sink in for a minute. Instead of simply removing the Palestinian activists who were causing the disruption, which the University of Sydney could have done, they locked the activists in the same room as the two Israeli academics they were protesting against. And both of the Israeli officials, by the way, are women. These, we're about to show you the footage now, these are the women from the Tel Aviv University who were sitting there just trying to do the, their own jobs, the work that they were invited to the University of Sydney from Israel to do. Shame! Yeah. So it, it isn't just a question of boycotting an, an Israeli institution. It, it's, a, it's a question of forcing a university which plays an active, violent, aggressive role in supporting Israel's apartheid. It's a question of getting that out of campus and showing that this campus supports Palestine, this campus opposes apartheid, and there is no room for any genocidal institution at Sydney Uni. So you could see the two women at the table there and their security official moved in front of one of them. One of the women who was locked in the room is Tel Aviv University's vice president, Milet Shamir. You can see her on your screen now. Now, there were other academics at the other stands around the room in the background and students were meant to be visiting their desks to discuss exchanges with universities in Germany, Israel, Taiwan, Canada and the United States. But the protesters disrupted it all. Now, there's footage that you can see from inside the room where the University of Sydney's own security guards are standing outside guarding the door. Have a look. Now, sources close to Tel Aviv University tell me that they were inside the room with the pro-Palestinian activists for an hour and a half. They were shocked and upset that the protesters weren't removed. At times, I'm told that the protesters yelled and berated the Israeli university representatives. And while they were locked in the room... The activists then started filming for online. They had so much time. They accused Israel of genocide and they demanded a boycott of all Israeli services. And we stand against the state of Israel and we will keep occupying, we'll keep fighting, keep striking until we make Israel a pariah state and we make it clear that there are no Israeli institutions welcome at UCID or 
on Gadigal land yeah. anywhere. Yeah. This campus supports Palestine. Uh, we, need, we need to protest this university off of campus. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free, free Palestine! Yeah, we have completely shut down this building. Mark Scott, this is a message to you. We're putting you on notice. Stop the lies, stop the ties! Stop the lies, cut the ties! Stop the lies, cut the ties! Well, the activists also claimed that there were members of the Nas National Tertiary Education Union who had gathered and were blockading outside. Outside at the front, we have rank and file members of the NTEU blockading the entrance. Yeah. Inside, we have members of the student body standing yeah, in, in solidarity with Palestine. Is the NTEU has brought rank and file members, they have left their lunch break, they are standing outside to say, <laughs> us on their lunch break. I think it's so important if you're on campus right now to get down here because we need to make sure the university can see that we do not support its, um, its uh, connections with Israeli universities. Now, as you heard, that pro-Palestinian activist there, she said they were locked inside on a hot day. She said some of them were fasting, locked inside. Well, after an hour and a half, the Tel Aviv University staff accepted the protest wasn't going to end. They were clearly not going to engage with students who were interested in the exchange program and they were escorted to a car. You can see them leaving there. Well, the pro-Palestinian activists celebrated the Israeli delegates leaving and they said, and listen to this, they said that the Israelis left in, and I quote, fear. They slunk away in cowardice, in fear. Is that seriously the climate we want here in Australia, where Israeli delegates have to leave in cowardice and fear? Of course we need free speech and obviously we can have disagreements about Israel's war on Hamas. But how can we have an environment where invited Israeli officials and senior officials have to slink away in fear. This is disgraceful. And then another student said this. So we actually shut down the exchange program that was happening. There was a stall for the Tel Aviv University to go on exchange um, to, to Tel Aviv. And we actually shut that down. They have, they have uh, given up, they've gone home, and we have successfully shut it down. We want to make sure that this campus is 100% a Palestinian-friendly campus. In the lies, cut the ties. 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 So they're celebrating that they've shut down the whole exchange program that was being promoted. Who is running the show? This is once again a case of Jews being punished through no fault of their own while just trying to do their day-to-day -day business. And this is also a harassment issue. A university that would presumably espouse values of tolerance has allowed a bunch of extremist activists who don't support Israel's right to exist to disrupt and destroy a collaborative exchange session and then allow the Palestinian activists of free reign to harass and intimidate the senior university staff. This is persecution, harassment and intimidation. Well, what does the University of Sydney have to say about this? Well, a spokesperson told us this evening that the incident was under investigation. They said, we're always working to ensure all our students, staff and visitors feel safe and welcome on our campuses and are aware of an incident that took place at this year's study abroad partner event. As an additional precaution this year, we hosted Tel Aviv University at our law school and Susan Wakel Health Building, where we had security in place. There was a protest that disrupted proceedings and some security measures were taken to ensure the safety of our community. At no time was any person locked in or detained. We have a rich history of activism and protest on our campuses and all students and staff have the right to express themselves freely as long as it's done safely and in accordance with our policies and the law. Protests may be rowdy and spirited, 
but they cannot interfere with the rights and freedoms of others, and this incident is under investigation. We support our students' right to express their opinions in a safe and respectful way and recently communi communicated to our community about our expectations of our staff and students at this challenging time. Well, the University of Sydney's Vice-Chancellor, Mark Scott, was previously the Managing Director at the ABC. I think it's pretty clear that he could be doing more to get anti-Semitism under control at the university. Just a few days before this unfolded, an anti-Israel University of Sydney academic, Nick Rema, started tweeting about the Tel Aviv University staff who were going to be visiting. And he said on Twitter or X that it was criminal that Sydney Uni is hosting Tel Aviv Uni at its study abroad fair. He said it was an institution directly responsible for the violent dispossession and murder of Palestinians. A claim, of course, that has no basis in fact. But this is the University of Sydney's own academic. And he then tweeted that both staff and students were protesting against the Tel Aviv University being present at the Sydney University Exchange Fair. Well, the bigger, more broader question that we have to look at is how young Jewish Australians are dealing with these extremist views day in and day out. Here is how one of those pro-Palestinian activists described what it's like every day at the University of Sydney. This university, which by the way is so pro-Palestine, every time I walk on campus, all I see is Palestinian flags, all I see is Palestinian flags. That's the work, that's the work of students, that's the work of, of rank and file staff and academics actually organising on campus to make sure that this is a campus that supports Palestine. That's the University of Sydney. Look, while many of you watching this tonight will know someone who's experienced anti-Semitism, whether it's at work or on the commute to work or on social media, the universities are the cold face of the problem. It's our young Jewish Australians who study hard at school, are lucky enough to then get into one of Australia's most prestigious universities, the University of Sydney, and then they have to come face to face with intense anti-Semitism on a daily basis. We are seeing no leadership on any of this. And this is the worst anti-Semitism crisis we've ever had in this country, in Australia. And the reason is because Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister, well, when he was young, he was one of these anti-Israel protesters shouting into the megaphone. <laughs> Right, Dave Sharma, who's Australia's former ambassador to Israel, he's going to join me a bit later on the show to speak about this story, also whether Israel should back down in Rafa. But let's bring in now Sky News host Liz Storer and contributor Joe Hildebrand. Um, welcome Good to evening. you both. Hello. Joe, this is the most bizarre response from the University mm. of Sydney to actually put security guards outside the door of this room to lock in the pro-Palestinian activists instead of removing them. Yeah, I, I, it's, look, it's an interesting one. It brings back a lot of memories to the madness of um, my uni days when I was a student activist as well and the sort of things I was involved. I remember being involved in an occupation of the administrative building um, of uh, Melbourne University, which is kind of like Sydney University, obviously, very old um, uh, sandstone uni. And, and suddenly the activists just start tearing up books, throwing books out the window. I think that's how they burn them. Then they started storming the library. Uh, the law library underneath the building for no apparent reason. So it just reminds you how quickly... I wasn't actually do doing the occupying, mind you. I was meant to be the um, liaison between the occupiers and the, the police and the university authorities. But your role was, hasn't changed over I was, the I was meant Joe. to be the reasonable one. But, um, and, and very quickly, I just saw these people just um, running yeah. riot like animals. Mm. Yeah. And I was talking to the, the head, um, the vice-chancellor's rep, and he said, you've got to do something. I said, I don't know what to do with these people. They're out of control. They're, and... and, and and you, you see that sort of, I suppose, now. And you see, firstly, how just utterly moronic these people are. I mean, nothing of what... Ne never mind the fact... I mean, imagine being locked in there for an hour and a half listening to those slogans chanted over and over again. You'd want to, you know, knock yourself off. Um, but it's, it's but accusing... Firstly, firstly yeah. saying, bragging about the fact... Well, bragging about the fact and saying, we want to wipe 
Israelis off the face. We want to wipe Israel off the face of campus. And then when they get their wish, you're saying, oh, look, they run away like cowards. They run away. Well, hang on, which is it? Do you want them to stay and talk yeah. and, try, and engage or do you want to just wipe them off? They don't even know mm. what they think. Um, and that I think, and, and I should make it clear, I'm absolutely 100% convinced this is not something Mark Scott or the um, administration at the university endorses at all. I do think, though, I know, in fact, that it's something they're very worried about and scared of and they're scared of escalating. So they knew this could have been an issue. That's why they chose they the that security, venue in yeah. the first place and had mm -hmm. the security there. So why did they then allow, if they knew there was going to be protesters and, yeah. and you know, one of their academics, Nick Rema, had tweeted encouraging people to protest, so why then, Liz... And, you know, the university might say, oh, this is a free speech issue. This is what they did say, by the way. This is a free speech issue. We have to allow mm -hmm. the protesters, our students, to protest. But there's a difference between free speech and hate speech and no-one seems to understand that. Yeah, and, Joe, you just said you're sure that these guys at the uni don't endorse this mm. and yet they have allowed it. Have these students been disciplined in any way? Absolutely not. And now we've got this word salad from the hierarchy at the uni saying, oh, there's an investigation into it, as if there might be some pending discipline of some kind. But as one of those students that you played has already said, and I've been to the campus, it used to be my old campus, and it is awash with Palestinian flags, Palestinian propaganda. They have taken over the campus. The university higher-ups have obviously allowed that much. So is it any wonder that these students feel emboldened to act in this way and will again because have they been disciplined? No. So they're going to say, look, we've got the clout, we got away with it, we feel perfectly justified in our completely ignorant stance, nobody has taken us on. We all know this is the snowflake generation. They simply cannot even bear that someone exists that doesn't agree with them, despite the fact that they're completely ignorant of any other mm. side of yeah. the story. And it, it goes again to highlight the idiocy of anti-Semitism, because as I've said before, even if words Worst case scenario was true. All the propaganda was right, and you are righteously indignant about it all here on your UCID university campus. What does the average everyday Jewish person, like mm. people working in a uni at Tel Aviv, got to do exactly. with whatever you think the Israeli government has gotten up to? No. Nothing. And yet you're treating these people mm. disgracefully. And, just, two, just, and <laughs> two women, by the way. Two women, by oh, the but way. But this is the thing. Just imagine, imagine if it was, a, say, a feminist meeting or a, would they allow a bunch of men's rights oh. activists in there and lock them in for an hour and a half? Mm. Imagine if it was mm. Chinese... Um, ac yes. Academics visiting. Yeah. Would they allow a bunch of Taiwanese activists yes. in there for an hour and a half? No. Always way. different treatment. Always it's different because treatment. The, 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 this, the Palestine thing is yeah. simply the Vietnam of this generation and it is the cause du jour and that is why everything is okay under the umbrella of it, where, where things would never, ever be... I don't around. have time to get into that analogy. I'm not Maybe. sure I agree with it, though, Joe. But anyway, <laughs> let's move on to another topic. Uh, well, the ABC, as you know, has got a new chair, Kim Williams. He's not shying away from one of the broadcaster's biggest problems, its lack of impartiality. He's warned staff on a podcast that he's got no time for journalists who aren't objective. Have a listen. You know, if you don't want to reflect a view that aspires to impartiality, don't work at the ABC. I mean, I, re I really think this is a very serious issue. Mm. This is a publicly funded organisation. It is a publicly accountable organisation. It is a respondent to legislation of the national parliament. And it must always aspire to be as fair-minded in, 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 in its work as it possibly can be. Liz, I mean, I think that all the chairs go in there with good intentions, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. nothing ever happened. Yeah, I'm not remotely excited about this. He said similar when we all learnt that he first got the gong, now he's actually in the chair and he's saying it again. And people desperately want to hear it, of course, so there is some applause scattered around the place. You hear these golf claps break out. But at the end of the day, I'll believe it when I see it. And so far, what he's saying simply reflects something as simple as, oh, OK, so you're familiar with the ABC Charter. Yes. Great start, good buddy. Research, that's good that's a good start. <laughs> but that's all it is. Yeah. Um, Joe, he also spoke about the social media use of some yeah. of the ABC journalists, which we know in yeah. the case of Louise Milligan has cost uh, 
well, it's our money, the taxpayers, yeah. a, a, a lot. I think even more broadly, I think social media has actually killed impartiality. I think it's becoming mm. clearer and clearer that True. it is probably the most toxic influence on our public life, on ourselves and on our politics. Um, I think that, you know, it's all very well and good to say to be impartial. The thing is with all the journos, the crusading journos, the left-wing journos at the ABC, they all think they are impartial. They think they are the impartial ones. They think they're just speaking the truth and that anyone who doesn't agree with him is a hate speech uh, warmonger or, what, or a misogynist or whatever it is. And, so th and this is the problem. When you have a, a world where truth is basically siloed into whatever it is you already believe and anything else is fake mm. news, then how do you get to impartiality? I don't think there is any way they are going to be able to get to it. And I think I was joking with a mate of mine on the way in here tonight. We're getting to the point now, I think, where any organisation, a news organisation that actually claims to be impartial is immediately suspect. That, mm. that there, is, there, is, there is not really any capacity for impartiality. And you look at the American news channels. I mean, what's most insufferable about the sort of news wars in, in America, for example, is that CNN or MSNBC, they all think they are absolutely 100% Fair and balanced. The difference, they think though, the but the difference, of media. course, is that the ABC is taxpayer funded to the tune of a billion dollars a year, and it's mm, in their charter. That is true, but, they, but again, they will, they will, you know, impartiality is now in the eye of the beholder, and yeah. it's a sad thing. I'd like to think there is objectivity and truth and facts out there. Um, now, a group of prominent Australian business leaders, politicians, and sporting officials and figures uh, have today expressed support for Wall Street Journal journalist Evan Gershowitz, who has now been in Russian prison for a year as of this week. This is a new News Corp campaign. It's called the Dear Evan campaign. And any of you at home are welcome to write a letter to Evan and we will send it to his family. Liz, no journalist deserves to be locked up for doing their job, for trying to bring the news to the rest of the world mm -hmm. in one of the most hostile dictatorships on earth. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of what China has done to several of our journos, uh, and that is all of a sudden turn around and say, you're a spy and we're locking you up, and that's as much details as anyone really gets on the matter until hopefully finally they're released. You're mm. quite right in saying it's been a year now. The US is doing everything that they can to bring Evan home. I think this is a great campaign, drawing attention to his plight and sending what support we can to his family, but I, I do doubt very much that it will put a dent in whatever the Kremlin's plans are for him. It seems like... They're holding on to him quite intentionally to use him as some sort of a chip. Yeah, or as a, as a, as a bargaining chip and yeah, exactly. they get leverage and you never know. But at least uh, hopefully when he is released, he will know that the whole community, global community, came out to support mm. him. I thought the same thing about Cheng Lee, I have to say, and mm. then look at what happened. So yeah. I actually really, you never know. I really believe in it. And I think if you have enough high-profile people in particular like Pat Cummins and Craig Foster, good on them, um, oh, I think that was very that much can, just no. Sometimes that can sometimes mm. that can cut through, and I think now. No, I think that was China being China. They decided for their own reasons in their own time. Yeah, that's right. I don't also necessarily a, also believe it also was also any... space saving. If Putin Putin wants to be seen as a legitimate ruler, he wants people to be on his side in the war of Ukraine, and he keeps trying to browbeat people as to uh, it's really Russia that's on the right side of history, all that sort of stuff. All these strong men want and crave legitimacy, and so. He, if he's given a window to actually free Evan at some point and say, see, we're a perfectly reasonable rule of law oriented mm. society and you thought we were a dictatorship, shame on you. Mm. That's the way it would operate. And if you have enough visibility and sometimes things like sports stars mm. can cut through, um, mm. you never know. I would have thought Sheng Li would never see the yep. light of day again and now here she is part of us. All right, we're out of time. Liz Story, Joe Hildebrand, thank you both so much. Thanks. Now, after the break, Dave Sharma discusses Israel's invasion of Rafa and also talks about the University of Sydney's decision to lock the doors. Plus, we'll cross live to London for the latest on Princess Kate's cancer diagnosis. See you. Welcome back. Well, tonight I've revealed that the University of Sydney locked visiting senior Israeli university staff in the same room as pro-Palestinian activists for an hour and a half. The university says it's now investigating. Joining me to discuss, Liberal Senator and former Australian Ambassador to Israel, Dave Sharma. Dave, welcome. 
Look, when I uh, called you this evening to tell you about this story and to tell you I wanted to ask you about it on the show tonight, you said you were actually aware of it uh, because you had met with those involved. That's right, Shari. Good evening. I'd, I'd met with um, the Tel Aviv University delegation at an event over the weekend and I asked them how their trip to Australia had been um, and they said, look, it had been great, but there had been an incident at the University of Sydney earlier in the week, which I was horrified uh, to learn about. Horrified not only that they were subject to that, I was embarrassed on behalf of Australia, but horrified to learn how the authorities at Sydney University had, had handled it. It just sounds completely bizarre. I mean, so the university staff were kept in the same room. They decided not to leave the event that they'd flown here for. Uh, and the pro-Palestinian activists then locked inside. We've seen the footage where the pro-Palestinian activists say they were locked in the room. We've seen the footage of the security guards standing outside. How can the University of Sydney have possibly thought this was a good idea? It beggars belief. Let's, I mean, let's be clear here as well. Tel Aviv University was there as a guest of and at the invitation of the University of Sydney to participate in a global education exchange fair designed to tell students what their opportunities are to study abroad and, 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 and whatnot. So Tel Aviv University is a guest. Uh, second point is um, all of the Tel Aviv University representatives happen to be female. They're women. Uh, and then we have this group, and the footage I've seen is, is largely young men who are protesting and yelling at megaphones in a room, behaving in a threatening and intimidating fashion, and in a way that surely is at odds with the values and ethos of the university, um, who aren't shut down by the security. Instead, they're all put together in the same room like some sort of, you know, bizarre conflict resolution doctrine or something. I don't know what they were thinking. But surely the students at Sydney University should have been allowed to speak to the representatives from Tel Aviv University without being interrupted or intimidated and surely those guests of ours mm. shouldn't have been harassed in this way. No, it's appalling. It's, it's, look, it's actually devastating um, to see that anti-Semitism that's happening at our universities. Uh, now, I want to ask you about the debate over Rafa. We've now seen Kamala Harris join the pylon. She's called for Netanyahu to call off uh, any planned action in Rafa. Have a look. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. A lot of international pressure now on Israel. Dave, what's your view on whether Netanyahu needs to now call off uh, Rafah or go ahead? Well, I just make the point that Israel is fighting a war here not against a geography, not against a city, not to occupy some territory. It's a war against a terrorist organisation, Hamas. And if Hamas is in Gaza City, then uh, that becomes the focal point of military operations. If Hamas is in Khan Yunus, then that is the focal point of military operations. And if Hamas is now in Rafah, then that is going to be the focal point of Israel's military operations. I mean, the way to stop an offensive in Rafah is for Hamas to, uh, I sound like a broken record here, but it's for Hamas to release the hostages and surrender, re surrender lay down its weapons. Then there will be no offensive in Rafah. But there's no point if you're Israel in trying to put out three quarters of the fire. If Hamas still has a presence in Rafah, and it seems clear that it does, then Israel needs to deal with that presence. And I think most of the world, including the United States, is united in their view that there will be no better future for Palestinians in Gaza or for the Israeli people until Hamas is eliminated and there can be no enduring peace until mm. Hamas is eliminated. So mm. I want to see Hamas eliminated. I don't want to see it done with any more harm to civilian lives than uh, than is absolutely necessary. I'd, I'd like to see it done with no loss of civilian life. But absolutely. the way that Hamas operates makes that nearly impossible. I think it's, it's bewildering why there's all this international pressure on Israel. Why, why isn't there international pressure on Hamas? You know, where are all these world leaders 
Why aren't they calling for Hamas to release the hostages? And I'm starting to see high-profile people calling for an unconditional ceasefire. Well, no. <laughs> Why should there be an unconditional ceasefire when there are still young men and women being locked up? God knows what's happening to them um, by terrorists. It's just appalling. Dave Sharma, uh, thank you for your time and also for your support and your strength in the fight against anti-Semitism. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, the Princess of Wales revealed, as you know, in a moving video over the weekend that she's had a cancer diagnosis. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Daily Mirror Royal Editor Russell Myers joins me now. Russell, thank you so much for your time. Look, everyone's now coming out blaming the media for speculation in the wake of that Photoshop debacle. But actually, the media were very respectful of Princess Kate's privacy for months. Uh, isn't really the issue here that the palace handled this so appallingly? Well, good evening, Shari. Well, I think not only the palace <clears throat> and their handling of it, but uh, the cascade of conspiracy theories that we'd seen on social media over the last few weeks has been not only outlandish, but it's been incredibly hurtful. And uh, you know, people at the palace have said to me over, over recent weeks that these people are people too. They have feelings. They're not immune to the fact that they are public figures. But it had just gone absolutely out of control. And I think there will be a review at Kensington Palace. They will have to look at the facts of, uh, of how badly they dealt with things over the last few weeks. And unfortunately, you know, the Princess of Wales had, uh, had been feeling under pressure. And, uh, and now we know after watching that heart breaking statement where she spoke about breaking the news to their three young children. Um, I think all of our best wishes are with her as she um, continues her road to recovery. Yeah, they definitely are. Look, King Charles met with the Princess of Wales for lunch just before she publicly revealed her cancer diagnosis. What do we know about their meeting and what they discussed? Well, he certainly did. On the Thursday, the day before the Princess of Wales made that uh, very public statement, they shared a lunch at Windsor. You know, and I've seen their bond up close, certainly over the last few years. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of respect, not only from Kate to Charles, of course, but the King finds her uh, fascinating, the way she, she's dealt with public pressure, the way she's brought up their three young children, very much out of the spotlight, wishing to bring them up in as normal a way as possible, despite, you know, all the pressures of the institution around them. And I think, that, you know, they will share a deep bond, both the King and Kate now going through their own individual cancer battles. And no doubt they will have to lean on each other and the family also support them over the next few weeks and months, because undoubtedly it's going to be a long road for both of them. Mm -mm. Look, uh, that message uh, right at the end of Princess Kate's video where she did say that she, um, you know, her, her, her heart goes out to everyone else dealing with a cancer battle. So many millions of people around the world, young and old, uh, that message would really resonate and, and mean a lot. And it is um, a brave decision for her to go public with this. Well, isn't it just? I mean, that is the the mark of the person, I think. You know, always thinking of others. She has uh, shown that throughout her work over the last few years, that she's very, very adept at situations of dealing with people and shining a light on issues that really do uh, are unrepresented, I suppose. And you, you, when she's making that statement, you know, she prepared for it for a couple of weeks. She spoke about her children but also speaking about putting our arm around people who are suffering from cancer. And I think that that is absolutely incredible thing to do, to put her, her own um, issues to the side, despite her darkest hour. Let's not forget she's been going through this for several weeks and, uh, and faces a long road ahead. And, uh, and certainly I think that a, a, a remarkable feat to, to do that in, a, in such a turbulent time. Yeah, indeed. Russell Myers, thank you so much for joining me. Now, coming up, Australians are losing trust in the Albanese government. Two polls now showing Labor's vote is slipping, plus more vicious assessments of Kevin Rudd after his bruising comments on Donald Trump.
Well, news poll in The Australian today shows that voters are losing trust in the Albanese government as Labor's vote slips. Labor dropped one point to 32%, while the coalition lifted theirs to 37%. This is the government's worst result since November. And things aren't looking any better in the Sydney Morning Herald's Resolve poll, which was published just this evening, with Albanese's net performance rating dropping from minus 6 to minus 11 Meanwhile, Peter Dutton's personal performance rating increased slightly from minus 11 to minus 9. Our political insiders panel, former Chief of Staff to Opposition Leader Bill Shorten and former Press Secretary to Scott Morrison, Andrew Carswell and Cameron Milner, join me now. Welcome to you both. Um, look, Andrew, if this result is repeated at the election, Albanese would still win, but it's likely he'd be looking at a minority government. Yeah, Shari, we're certainly sliding towards a, a pretty unholy and unruly um, minority government uh, of Labor, Greens and Teals and whoever else they can cobble together. That, that is the reality of where we're heading uh, and the Australian, um, Australian's Dennis Shanahan made that very clear today in suggesting that history is against the Albanese government in the first place anyway. No government mm. since the Second World War has increased their margin from the first term to second term. So minority government... Lock it in, strap yourself in, it's going to get ugly. Uh, on, on the personal side, though, that Albanese's personal ratings are just kind of clinging on and you get the sense that, um, that there is this kind of stubborn uh, perception from the, of those that are not really engaged with politics um, and certainly don't spend any time up here that Albanese is somehow a good bloke. There is still that. Anyone that's watched any focus groups uh, in the last couple of weeks will know that that perception is there. Uh, mm. And it hasn't... It, it's slowly being eroded, but it's still there. Uh, mm. And the Coalition really has that as their, as their target if they really want to uh, bring the Albanese government down, is to bring this guy's stubborn popularity down. That mm. is the target. And you just get the sense that, there's, that Albanese is one step, one mistake, one uh, scandal away from the public going, doesn't matter if you, we think you're a good bloke, we need you to be a better Prime Minister. mm, -mm. Cameron Milner, what do you think about this? I mean, it, look, it might surprise you to hear me say it, but I think um, Albanese actually is a good bloke. The issue is that he's running this socialist left agenda, that he's abandoned the Jewish community, that he's been weak on border security. I mean, I, look, I don't want to run through every single uh, scandal and failing here, but... He, There's a long list, isn't there, Shari? A long list, and, and for <laughs> most people, it's that he hasn't addressed the cost of living crisis. He promised, that was his main election pledge uh, before the uh, federal election, that life would be more affordable, and, in fact, it's far less affordable. Well, you can be a good bloke and a terrible Prime Minister, and I think Albanese is proving that. I mean, these are dreadful numbers for Labor. Uh, we're a first-term government up against Peter Dutton and a ramshackle group of coalition people who were smashed the last election, um, and yet we're looking like minority government. I agree with you, Andrew. I think the disaster of a Greens-Teal-Albo alliance would be the worst possible outcome for Australia, and that's what Albanese seems to be happy with, because for Albanese, it's not about Labor government. It's about him being Prime Minister. Uh, it's all about the selfie. It's not about the substance. Uh, so that's what we're dealing with. And I think what the numbers show, uh, for those who are engaged, Andrew, uh, is that people don't like liars. People don't like the Prime Minister lying about what he said before the election and what he did after the election. And also demonstrates that Dunkley was a chimera. Like, it was an, mm. you know, a bonfire of the vanities for the moment to win a by-election and scrape home a win. It wasn't about winning the next election and it certainly wasn't about majority government. Mm -mm. I mean, for someone who said, my word is my bond, he has broken a promise so many times. And, and, and Andrew Carswell, the lesson that Labor has taken from the broken promise on stage three tax cuts is that it was a genius move that they're likely to repeat again with other more radical reforms. Well, they would do anything they can to, to remain in power. Uh, and values just go out the window when you are trying to maintain power. I mean, over the next six months, they've got to do a really ugly dance with the Greens and the crossbench on a number of different environmental reforms. Uh, you wait till they throw out their values and their, what they've stood for for, you know, for for decades just to stay in power, just to, to, to stave off the, uh, the, the inevitable decline here. They'll do anything they can to remain in power. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, Kevin Wright, it's been revealed by Christopher Dore on the nightly that he's about to lose one of his top diplomats in Washington, D.C. He reports that the deputy head of mission, Paul Myler, is leaving his post imminently. There's all the denials that, you know, there's been no falling out between the pair at all. Um, uh, Cameron, what do you think about this? This is going to be a loss to Team Rudd. Oh, look, I think Kevin is quite capable of being the great ambassador for Australia that he actually is. Um, I think last week was a storm in a teacup. You had Nigel Farage talking to, Ke talking to Trump and trying to get a headline out of a piece of news on GB News. So, look, my view is very different. I think Kevin's doing a great job as the ambassador for Australia. Uh, I think Kevin's enemies love to see him stumble, but I actually think he's doing a great job and will do a great job, whoever the president, whether it's Biden or Trump, going forward, because he'll be Australia's representative. Mm -mm. Look, I think he's going to struggle under uh, Trump if Trump gets back in. And many of his inner circle have made that clear even before the Farage uh, interview. I've played you the comments that Steve Bannon made on my show um, just last month. But talking of Rudd's history of insults, uh, have a listen to what Labor MP Jenny George, who spoke to Ben Fordham this morning, said about Rudd. Kevin Rudd said you had no merit to keep your job as Parliamentary Secretary. This is because you had concerns about Kevin Rudd's carbon pollution reduction scheme. How did you respond to him when he said that to you? The only reason I was ever told was by the leader then, Kevin Rudd, who told me, well, Jenny, you're not going to be a Parliamentary Secretary because you don't have merit. And I thought, well, how am I going to respond to this? I mean, this was on the phone. He didn't even say it to me to my face. And I had just been elected by the voters in Throsby with a 65% primary vote. I mean, Andrew, this is Jenny George, who is a senior Labor female inside the party, a senior union official, highly talented, very smart. Uh, she regularly watches this program, so we can only say nice things about her, but we would anyway. Um, but look, this is just how Rudd treated women within his own team. Yeah, well, Jenny's been on, on the right side of history in regards to that Labor policy. Uh, in terms of Rudd's emissions policy, she was on the right side of that uh, and it was, she was proven correct uh, in pushing back against that policy. But she's also on the right side of uh, pushing back against the current Labor uh, energy and climate policy, which is you know, becoming a disaster more and more by the day, particularly her issue with the renewable energy target, which is excessive. I mean, every... every um, uh, major country in Europe is starting to walk away from their rets at the moment because they are, they are quickly realising that they can't provide uh, reliable and affordable energy with 100% renewable energy. Mm. Uh, France has dropped theirs. Uh, Sweden has included nuclear energy in their, um, in their RET as well, so they only need solar and, and wind to get to 70%. So the, the rest of the world is starting to walk away and getting sceptical of these uh, high targets and, and we are actually, you know, going the other way. We're mm. locking in our targets. Mm. And Although... the bad thing about excessive targets, you've got to go and reach them, right? So you mm. put disastrous policies, fast and hard policies in place to reach them because it's all about the target and not about reliable and affordable energy. I mean, Cameron, it does seem like Chris Bowen is realising he might have gone too far with his uh, high fuel efficiency standard for petrol cars, though. Look, I think that's right, and I think that's the sort of reality of the situation. If we're not manufacturing cars in Australia, we are going to have to be on international standards. And if the US is the largest auto market in the world, has set a benchmark that still reduces carbon pollution, let's not forget that. But that actually makes sense. And I've always found Chris a pretty logical person, despite some comments and commentary about him. Very logical person, very straightforward person, and actually wanting to achieve a good policy outcome and balance. And on the car stuff, he's arrived at the right place. Cameron, you seem to have had a change in tune tonight. We haven't heard any criticisms from you of, uh, of, of Labor tonight. Maybe you're saving it up for your uh, column later in the week. All right, Cameron Milner, Andrew Carswell, thank, thank you, you both so much for joining me. After the break, Joe Biden can't seem to get ahead in the polls. Trump is trailing closely, or he's ahead. Uh, we'll have the latest results from voters after the break. Welcome back. Well, two of Donald Trump's legal battles are now coming to a head. A judge is expected at a hearing today in the US to set a start date for his hush money payment to porn star criminal trial. But the more explosive story, Trump has until the end of the day to secure a bond for the multi-million dollar civil fraud judgment against him. Let's bring in now 
Sky News contributor Kosha Garda. Kosha, if Trump doesn't find a spare half a billion dollars, and that, by the way, is 695 Aussie dollars, um, his assets could start to be seized as soon as Tuesday morning. This is unbelievable. It really is, Sherry. Great to be with you, as always. You know, the, most of the eye of the world has been on the four criminal trials, because those ultimately uh, carry potential jail time, whereas these were the civil cases that people weren't that focused on. Until now, because of the, the scale of the judgment that was given um, when he was convicted with that, half a billion U.S. dollars, as you mentioned. There's an interest rate where I think it's something like $183,000 U.S. per day for every day that it gets uh, delayed. And people, even billionaires, don't typically have that kind of liquidity, that level of cash lying around. So his legal team is looking to appeal this. It's likely to go probably all the way up to the Supreme Court on the basis of the Eighth Amendment, which says you shall not inflict cruel and unusual punishment. This is completely disproportionate to what this type of charge would typically carry. But the perversion, like there's a perverseness to this process where even as it's making its way up the court system, you have to pay, post that bond Mm -hmm. during that process. And um, it's becoming very difficult for him to secure that. If they seize the assets, I think just politically, just think about what that's going to look like, because most people don't really support this judgment or this ruling. There were no plaintiffs that were harmed or hurt. And then if you picture the attorney general of the United States going out there, the governor going out there and seizing iconic mm. Trump assets, uh, I think it's going to backfire politically. And not only that, but, uh, you know, many of us have seen the clips of Letitia James um, for many years saying that she was going to go after Trump. This is exactly what she's doing. So it is highly political. The judicial system in the U.S. is very political, unlike ours here. But the issue is, and Trump has said it himself, if he has to have a fire sale, well, by the time he's won his appeal, if he wins it, um, his assets would be gone. That's right. And, you know, there's a, it's bigger than Trump. This is what a lot of people have been saying, too, that there's sort of almost this, like, overzealousness or this frenzy for this get Trump uh, syndrome, if you will, that's out there. And as you mentioned, Lee James even campaigned on that and won her election on that basis. But it's almost bigger than Trump because it really is going to turn off good people from entering politics, outsiders from entering politics, and really people from doing business in New York. And there's lots of high-profile businessmen like Kevin O'Leary, uh, who's on the U.S. version of Shark Tank, has been coming out. Out on a tear on this issue, saying, like, why would anybody in their right mind want to do business in the state of New York? Because this is setting a precedent that at any time the state could bring these charges against you. A jury might, if they just don't like you politically or for any other reason, might convict you. And, you know, what's in it for somebody who wants to do that? So I think there's just a, a lot of negative for the state of New York and for the country, regardless of what happens with this particular case and with Trump. Mm. Talk us through how the latest polls are looking for Trump and Biden. Um, you know, it's, he's, as you mentioned uh, at the setup, they're trailing. Trump is trailing by just a few points or ahead. Um, if you look at the real clear uh, RCP average for, for polls, uh, he's pretty much close. But what's more interesting is in those battleground states, and specifically Michigan, the Biden campaign is really in trouble. And the thing with Michigan is, you know, there's a, an immediate term effect that's happening in the wake of October 7th. And we've talked about this before, where the, the Democrat voter base has really been this coalition of the fringes. And there's a big faction, a big Muslim community over there in Dearborn, Michigan, that do not like um, the handling of that issue and uh, support for Israel. That's just what it is. And so he's really hurting with that constituency. But there's also a longer term problem with Michigan that the Democrats have been facing anyway, where the working class voter has has been peeling away from them. And you saw that with how Bernie Sanders did, um, the fact that Hillary Clinton lost mm. uh, Michigan. It was really close in the last election. So you couple that with the, what's happening with the, this issue around October 7th and how it's playing out in domestic U.S. politics. Mm. I think that's going to be a, a big uh, issue for the Biden campaign to correct between now and then. He's got seven months, which is yep. a lifetime in politics. But that's yep. what the All polls right. suggest today. Kosha Garda, thank you so much for joining us. We're out of time. I'll see you tomorrow at 8. And here's Paul Murray.